I'm not sure if anybody here would consider themselves a, an avid an avid fisherman or not. Uh, I know there's a few of you that fish uh, from time to time. I am not. I am not a fisherman. However, I have fished, uh, particularly as a boy, I guess. Uh, from what I remember, I fished quite a bit when I was a boy. I remember very fondly of days in which uh, we lived in Russagornish and uh, lived across the road from actually Annette, who is, I think, in the nursery this morning. But uh, Annette and her brother, Sean. Uh, Sean was my best friend growing up in Russagornish. And, of course, the creek was right behind the house. And so it wasn't unusual that on a nice summer's day that Sean and I and a few other friends, we'd go down. And, and from what I remember, we always, you know, we always... We always came home with something, and it was a good time and uh, enjoyed it very much. But now I am not a fisherman. I do still have a fishing rod or two in my garage, but they've got quite a bit of dust on them, haven't been used in quite a while. But uh, I do know this about fishermen. I do know this about fishermen. People that take fishing very, very seriously, it's really not about the fish, right? It's really not about the fish. It, it's, it's about the experience of fishing is really what it's all about. Now, I'm not suggesting that an avid fisherman does not want to fill his quota for the day, whatever that might be. But really, it's not about, it's not about the fish. It's about the experience. It's about getting away. It's about getting on the water or near the water. It's about getting off the grid and just, just getting away. That's really what it's, it's all about, right? And uh, that's good. Fish sometimes have very, very little little to do with it. Uh, read some things this week about just some people that take fishing very, very serious. And just to, I guess, prove to you how serious some people take their fishing, here's just a few, a few quotes. Obviously, this first guy's an avid one. He says, I've got nine, nine problems and fishing solves them all, right? Wouldn't that be great if that was the case? Simple trip to the brook or the lake would do it. Next one, if people concentrated on the real important things in life, there'd be a shortage of fishing poles, Okay, so everybody should have at least one or two fishing poles in their garage or shed. You've heard this before. A bad day fishing is better than a good day at work. You've heard, everybody's heard that one before, right? That's a pretty common one. Okay, here's one for the ladies. A fishing date is the best kind of date, okay? I don't know, is Jay here? Jay Earl? Jay's not here this morning, is he? Jay loves to go fishing, doesn't he? Yeah? Jay loves to go fishing. He and Allison go fishing all the time. I'm not sure if they take their ladies or not. Next one. I debated about sharing this one. It's better to sit in a boat thinking about God than to sit in church thinking about fishing. Okay? Now, this one is debatable, but I see the, I see the value in it. Okay? You know, people that love fishing love fishing, but it's... It's not entirely about the fish. Can I ask you, can we talk about the story of Jonah and not talk about the fish? Can we do that? It's pretty hard, isn't it? It's pretty hard to talk about Jonah and not talk about the fish. Because immediately, in your mind, the mind of a child, the mind of the guy that's over at Irving right now getting a coffee, if I was to say, what do you know about Jonah? And we talk about the fish, that great big fish. So it is. It's hard to talk about a story. But you know what? Jonah has four chapters and the fish is only really mentioned in one of them. Chapter two. He's actually mentioned in the last verse of the first chapter. And I'm going to read the first chapter to you here in just a minute, but I'm not going to read the last verse. You want to know why? Because we're not going to talk about the fish today. Matter of fact, you're not going to hear me say that word again the rest of the sermon. Okay. You will not hear that four letter word again. For the rest of this sermon. And if you hear me say it. You stand up and shout. Okay. Because I'm going to try not to say it. Because Jonah is more. Than just a. You know what. Right. It's a bigger story than that. And that's what I want to focus on with you this morning. Jonah chapter 1. Let's read through this chapter. Quickly. It says the word of the Lord came to Jonah. The son of Amittai. Go to that great city of Nineveh and preach against it because its wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed to Tarshish. He went down to Joppa where he found a ship bound uh, for that port. After paying the fare, 
he went aboard and he sailed to Tarshish uh, to flee the Lord. It says, then the Lord sent a great wind on the sea and such a great uh, violent storm that the ship was threatened to break up. All of the sailors were afraid. Each cried out to their own God. They threw cargo into the sea to lighten the ship. But Jonah had gone below the deck where he lay and he fell into a deep sleep. The captain went to him and said, how can you sleep? Get up, call on your God. Maybe he can take notice of us and we will not perish. And then the sailors said to each other, come, let us cast lots to find out who is responsible for this calamity. And they cast lots and the lot fell on Jonah. So they asked him, tell us, who is responsible for making all this trouble for us? Uh, what, do you, what do you do? Where do you come from? What is your country? From what people are you? He answered, I am a Hebrew and I worship the Lord, the God of heaven who made the sea and the land. This terrified them. And they asked, what have you done? They knew that he was running away from the Lord because he had already told them so. The sea was getting rougher and rougher. So they asked him, what should we do to you to make the sea calm down for us? Pick me up and throw me in the sea, he replied, and it will become calm. I know that it is my fault that this great storm has come upon you. Instead, the men did their best to row back to the land, but they could not, for the sea grew even wilder than before. And then they cried to the Lord, O Lord, please do not let us die for taking this man's life. Do not hold us accountable for killing an innocent man. For you, O Lord, have done as you pleased. Then they took Jonah, they threw him overboard, and the raging sea grew calm. At this, the men greatly feared the Lord. They offered a sacrifice to the Lord, and they made vows to him. And if you would like to read the last verse by yourself, you can do that. But I'm not going to read that because we're not going to talk about it today. Because this story is more than maybe just what we think about it. This month of January, we've been talking about the undeniable comfort that comes when we pray. And over these last three weeks, we've talked about some, some different scenarios in our life when, when we really just need God and we pray and just God comforts us and God meets us there and God makes a difference. And today in this chapter, if I hope you notice that there's a prayer offered in this chapter. There's a prayer offered. And we're going to look at that prayer and the comfort that came as a result, as a result of that prayer. Sometimes you miss things in familiar stories. Sometimes you know a story really well and you read it, or you hear it, and all of a sudden you, you realize, oh, I didn't realize that, or I'd forgotten about that. And that was, that was the case with me when I think about this story of, of Jonah. Because we know that Jonah ended up in Nineveh. He does. By the end of the chapter, he ends up in Nineveh, and he preaches to the people there whom God sent him to originally. And we know that the people of Nineveh got saved. And, and the story of Nineveh's salvation is, is truly... The greatest revival story of all time. I don't think there's another story that talks about a revival that took place like the the revival that took place here. Where a group of people were so far from God and they heard the message of God and they turned to God. It's an amazing amazing story. And, And again, that's what we think of when we think about the story of of Jonah. But in chapter 1... There's a revival that takes place in chapter 1 as well. In this first chapter, we see the entire crew of this fateful ship saved. And, and really this morning, as much as we want to talk about Jonah, I want to talk about the men of this ship and the fact that they were lost, but God saved them. And that's really what, what I'd like to share with you here this morning, and probably the best place to start is with the acknowledgement that these men needed to be saved. It says in verse four, if I, you don't mind just looking back with me again to verse four, it says, "It says, and the Lord sent a great wind." It's 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 worth noting that God is the one that sent this storm. Okay, this was just not a a freak occurrence of nature. God sent this storm. 
great wind on the sea, with such a violent storm arose that the ship threatened to break up. So here we have uh, Jonah and this crew, and they needed to be saved. Now, there's something very obvious here, and then there's something that's not quite so obvious, and I want to point both of them out to you. What's the obvious thing? The obvious thing is that they needed to be saved from this storm, okay? Now, it doesn't tell us a lot of details of this storm, but it says that it was such a storm that it was, they were in fear that the ship was going to break up. Now, you know there are storms, and then there are storms. We've all been in storms, and then we've all been in storms, okay? We've been in storms that have been, you know, just a nuisance to us, right? But then we have been in storms, like the crew of the ship, where we were, where we were frightened, Maybe some of you have actually been in a storm where really you thought, maybe you thought your life was in jeopardy. So, so that's the obvious thing. As we read this chapter, it's obvious. And, and you know what? As you keep reading this chapter, you see the storm keeps getting worse and worse. It's like you go into the front window and looking out, and every time you got, there's more snow or there's more wind, and you think, wow, this storm's getting worse. And as we read through chapter 1, the storm got worse and worse and worse. So that's the obvious thing, okay? That they needed to be saved from the storm. Here's the thing that's not so obvious, and it doesn't actually come right out and say it, but it's, it's a fact. These men need to be saved because, because they were sinners. Okay, They needed to be saved because of the storm. But they also needed to be saved because they were sinners. It says in Romans chapter 3, it says, All have sinned and fallen short of God's glory. Everybody. They needed to be saved. We need to be saved. Everybody needs to be saved. No one, and I repeat, no one has any hope for eternity with God if they are not saved from their sins. Okay? We're going to talk more about that later. So keep that thought in mind. But right now, I'd just like to look with you at some of their attempts. Can I say futile attempts? Some of, their, some of their attempts to save themselves. They were desperate attempts, but when we find our life in jeopardy, we get desperate, don't we? And so look what they did. The first thing that they did in a, in a desperate attempt is they called out to their pagan gods, is what they did. Verse 5. It says in verse 5, it says, All of the sailors were afraid, and each cried out to his own god. Now, I think we can make the assumption, based on that statement alone, that these men had some kind of a religious background, okay? They obviously did not worship the God of, of Jonah or the God of Abraham, but they had, their, they had their God or they had their gods. And when you're in the middle of a storm, in a ship that's going down, this would seem to be as good a time as any to call upon your gods, okay? And that's what they did. But you know the story. And I know the story, that it didn't work. Their gods did not save them. And this would be a good point for us to remember, that religion will not save you, okay? Religion will not save you. Church will not save you. And I say that because some people still have in their mind the idea that going to church and going through the motions is what saves you. And whether it be a Baptist church or whether it be a, 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 a Hindu uh, worship center, or whether it be a Muslim mosque, it doesn't matter. Religion will not save you. And certainly these men are, are proof of that. They, they called out to their gods, but it didn't work. The second uh, desperate attempt is that, they, is that they lightened the load. It, says, it goes on to say in that very same verse, it says all the sailors, they were afraid, they cried out to their own gods, and they... And they threw the cargo into the sea to lighten the ship. Now, that's just a very practical, common sense response, right? Like, who here wouldn't have done the same thing? Obviously, if the ship is going down and the cargo is kind of expediating that, and if your life is more valuable than the cargo, why wouldn't you throw the cargo overboard? Regardless of what it is, gold or silver or precious stones, throw it over because it's of no value to you if you all drown, right? So that's what they did. They started throwing things overboard. Everything that they didn't need, I expect, went over the side of that ship. But again, it didn't uh, didn't work. 
It didn't work. It wasn't enough because the storm was so great. The third thing that they did as a desperate attempt to uh, save themselves is they began to cast lots. It goes on to say, where is it? Verse 7, it says, And then the sailors said to each other, Come, let us cast lots and find out who is responsible for this calamity. It says they cast lots and the lot fell on Jonah. You can tell that they are getting desperate to find a solution because they reach out to this this practice of casting lots. Most historians will tell you that very likely what happened here was a, was a bag of stones, a bag of rocks. And one would reach into the bag and take out a stone, and a specifically marked stone would identify, you know, the winner <laughs> or the guilty. Anybody watch Survivor at home? Survivor? Television show Survivor? You don't be embarrassed. They do this in Survivor all the time. When they have to determine a, a culprit of some sort, they, they bring out the bag and you pull out the stone. Whoever gets the marked stone, you're the man. Or you're the woman. Did you know that God is always in control? Did you know that? He's always in control. Even, even when you don't think God is in control, God is always in control. And therefore, when Jonah reached his hand into that bag, guess what? He pulled out the marked stone. Because God is always in control. We've got our culprit. It says in verse 11, it says in the sea, here it is right again. It says the sea was getting rougher and rougher. And so they asked him, what should we do with you to make the sea calm down for us? Okay? Okay. Jonah, you're the guy, so so, so what what do we do now? What do we do now? And I tell you, the next two verses are great verses. Verses 12 and verse 13. I am so impressed with what takes place in verse 12 and 13. I actually thought, when I first started this, I thought my whole sermon is just going to be on these two verses. Because I was so impressed with what I saw here. But as you can see, (laughs) it's bigger than that. But I want to just really, if I haven't emphasized it enough, can I say it again? I am really impressed with what I see in these next two verses. The first thing we see in verse 12 is Jonah's honesty. What it says. Pick me up. Throw me into the sea. And it will become calm, for I know that it is my fault that this storm has come upon you. It's my fault. I appreciate, and I know you do as well. I know I speak for everybody here. I appreciate so much when people are just honest, right? They just tell you, they just tell you, they just tell you the honest truth. Even if they're wrong. Even if they've screwed up. Even if they've made the mess, I just appreciate it when I hear just someone taking responsibility and saying, do you know what? This has happened because of what I did or because of what I didn't do. And Jonah admits it. He just puts it all on the table. He owns it completely. My fault put me over over the edge. And to compare that, when people don't own up, when people don't take responsibility, you know what, they, they, they scheme and they make excuses, right? This is why this happened. And they try and convince you that there are other circumstances. Or when they pass the buck and they start blaming it on him. Or they blame it on her. You, we hear this all the time, don't we? That is our, that is our mode of operation. So when all of a sudden someone comes along and says, you know what? Yep, it's my fault. Isn't that refreshing? Makes you want to give them a hug or something. You just feel so good that they've they've been up front. I was listening to an interview on the radio here, I'm going to say about a month ago. It's two ladies. 
One was uh, Susan McCarth- uh, McCarthy, and the other was Marjorie Ingalls. Ingalls. They, uh, they run a blog called Sorry Watch. And what they do is they just watch media, they watch the news. Whenever somebody in a public situation has to give an apology, they watch it and they analyze it. And they put them in, in different categories. So, you know, this was a good apology. This was a really good apology. And, and they, they love to highlight bad apologies. Because sometimes we apologize and we think, good, we're done. Sometimes apologies are not apologies. One of the things that they really emphasize, that if you use the word if in your apology, it's, it, it's not a good apology. You know, I'm sorry if I hurt you. Now, that sounds good to us. You know what? I'm sorry if I hurt you. If something I did hurt you, if, 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 I'm sorry. If, if should not be a part of the equation. What you should say, I'm sorry that I hurt you. Because when you use that word if, you're, you're putting some question into it. Maybe you think you're hurt. I'm not so sure you're hurt. I'm not so sure it's my fault, but if I can say this, you've got to be careful when you use the word if. But they also highlight some good apologies. And uh, now this, these are a couple ladies who are out of the United States. But you know who they say gave the greatest apology they've ever heard? Bob Paulson, commissioner of the RCMP. And he gave it just back in October, just past October, in relation to the sexual discrimination and harassment that's been happening in the RCMP. And these ladies, they've looked at a lot of apologies over the years. You know what they said? They said, he nailed it. These are just some of the words that Paulson shared back in October. He said, you came to the RCMP wanting to personally contribute to your community, and we failed you. We hurt you. And for that, I'm truly sorry. You can now take some comfort in knowing that you have made a difference. Because of you, your courage, and your refusal to be silent, the RCMP will never be the same. Instead of succeeding and thriving in a supportive and an inclusive workplace, many women have suffered careers scarred by gender and sexual discrimination, bullying, and harassment. I must also apologize to all Canadians. I know how disappointed you have been in the force, as you've heard some of these very public, shameful examples of disgraceful conduct within our ranks. And, what, and what's not conveyed in just what I've read What's not conveyed is the deep emotion in his voice when he read it. And so these ladies at Sorry Watch, they say, way to go, Bob. You gave a good apology. It was from your heart, it was meaningful, and it made a difference. Jonah was honest. And he said, it's my fault. So that's the first thing I'm just really impressed with. With Jonah. The second thing that I'm really impressed with is what happens in the next verse. And that's the crew's compassion. Again, look what it says in verse 13. It says, instead, it says, the men did their best to row back to land. And they could not for the sea grew even wilder than before. Put yourself in this crew's position, okay? You're in the middle of the the worst storm you've ever been in your life. You truly think this ship is going down. And all of a sudden, this guy that you've known for what? Two, three, four, maybe five or six hours. You haven't known him long. You've just got to know him this day. He admits that he's the problem. And he says, if you throw me overboard, the sea will become calm. What would you do? I know what I would do. I would pat him on the back, thank him very much, and say, here, let me help you over the rail. (laughs) Okay? Sounds simple, doesn't it? That's what I would do. He's admitted to it. He says he's the guilty one. He wants to do it. 
And I'm scared to death that I'm going to die. But that's not what they did. What did they do? It says they rode even harder than before. And you know what? That, I'm impressed by that. I'm impressed by the fact that they would do that. For this guy that was running from God. There's a lot of good people out there, right? There's a lot of good people in the world out there. There's a lot of good people out there that don't come to church, but they're good people. I bet you know some people like that. Some people that they're just, you know, they're just the salt of the earth, okay? Okay? Um, they volunteer. They serve the community. Okay? They're generous. They give. They have no problem opening up their wallet or their purse, and they give. They're, they're people that, you know, what do we say? They give you the shirt off their back. Okay? I expect, if I ask you, do you know anybody like that that would give the shirt off their back, but they have no interest in God whatsoever? I can tell you people like that. I know people not too far from here that are just like that. Okay? And, uh, you know, I'm just, I'm in awe of them, that, that, that people are like that. But you know what? They're still lost. And they still need to be saved. Good people. How many remember Harry Waugh? Harry Waugh was a pastor prior to us coming here. And Harry used to always say this. I, I heard him say it, I've heard him say it three or four times about speaking about an individual. And he would say this, that guy is far too nice a guy to go to hell. I heard him say that. He's far too nice a guy to go to hell. In other words, he's a great guy. He's got so many good qualities about him. But he's lost. And he needs to be saved. Titus chapter 3, it says, Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saves us. It's nothing. It's nothing that we can do. And so we finally get to the prayer. Haven't even got there yet. The prayer is in verse 14. It's one prayer, but it has two results. Isn't that great? Sometimes you pray for something, you get an answer and say, this is great. Wouldn't it be great if you prayed for something and you got two results? Look what the prayer says in verse 14. It says, and they cried, and they cried to the Lord, Lord, please do not let us die. That's a good prayer. Do not let us die for taking this man's life. Do not hold us accountable for killing an innocent man. For you, O Lord, have done as you pleased. Then they took Jonah and they threw him overboard. They just threw him overboard. And as soon as Jonah was thrown overboard, the first result took place. Here's the first result. A calm sea. The sea became still. It says that they threw him overboard. And it says, and the raging the raging sea grew calm. Now, I remind you this month that we are talking about the undeniable comfort that comes when we pray. And that obviously happened right here. These guys prayed, God, don't hold us accountable for throwing this man overboard. Save us. We don't want to die. Jonah goes over the side of the boat. As soon as his body hits that water... Everything becomes still. And you can only imagine just the relief that these men had. But do you know what? There's, a, there's another result to this prayer. And it goes right on in that very same passage, that next verse. Not only was there a, a calm sea, but there ended up a calm crew. Verse 16 it says that, that at this, it says, 
the men greatly feared the Lord, and they offered sacrifices to the Lord, and they made vows to him. They immediately not only experienced the, the, a, a calmness in, in the surroundings, but in their hearts. Now, I know some of you are cynical, right? Don't raise your hand. I know who you are. Some people are cynical. Okay? And I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, it was just because of the storm. You know? They were scared to death. The storm stopped. They were happy. They, they raised their hands and thank you, God. You know? It was an emotional response. You know? Okay. Think what you will. Think what you will. But I know <laughs> that when I get to heaven, I am going to meet the crew of that faithful ship. And we're going to hear what they experienced that night with Jonah. Because they were lost and they needed to be saved. Many of you have storm stories. What do I mean by that? I mean that, that many of you, not all of you, I don't have a storm story. But some of you have a storm story where you had a crisis in your life, an unexpected crisis. Something came into your life at some point in your journey. And it was so significant that you had nowhere to turn but to God. And you could look back at that storm in your life. Maybe it was just a day. Maybe it was a month. Maybe it was years, that storm in your life. And you look back at that and you recognize that that is what God used. That was the event in my life that caused me to turn to God. Because if it wasn't for that, I may have never turned to God. But God used that and I turned to Him. And some of you have storm stories. You might not have been out on the high seas, but... But you had a storm. And let me remind every single one of you here today that there are many storms ahead. I don't know how much time I got or I don't know how much time you got left in this world, but there are storms ahead. Most of your storms will be, well, they'll be fairly mild. There are storms and you'll get through them fine. Okay? But it's more than likely that in the course of my life and your life, we will hit some violent storms. There'll be things that will just floor us. And so my question to you this morning is, why would you want to go through them alone, right? Why would you want to weather the storm by yourself? Wouldn't it make sense to do it with Jesus? I don't know if you remember the verse that I've quoted each week for this month, these four, these four Sundays. It's in Psalm 145. I think it's verse 18. It says, The Lord is near to those that call on Him. It's simple as that. The Lord is near to those that call on Him. And He wants to be with you through your storm. Because there is an undeniable comfort that comes when we pray and when we give our hearts to God. You hear me often speak about Bill Hybels, pastor at Willow Creek Community Church in Illinois. I listen to Bill. I don't listen to him every week, but I try and listen to him as often as I can. And recently I listened to a message that Bill shared about a friend of his by the name of David, Dave. And Dave is an active member of his church at Willow Creek. But Bill's relationship with Dave went prior to him becoming a follower of Jesus. They were actually sailing buddies. Uh, Hybels, if you've ever read any of his books or listened to him, he, he loves sailing. Okay? He talked about sailing all the time. And, he, and Dave was his sailing buddy. I'm not sure exactly how they met, but uh, they, they both had an interest in sailing and they sailed together. And yet, Dave wasn't saved, he didn't go to church, but they were still good friends, and they sailed together. On this one particular morning, they'd been out sailing for the morning, and uh, they came back to Bill's place, his house, because that's where David left his car. And as they were just saying goodbye to each other there in the dooryard, Bill started walking to the house, and Dave was putting his stuff in his car and getting ready to pull out of the driveway. It was a cool morning, and the temperature was dropping, 
And Bill, Bill says, I just, I was just prompted by God to go back to him. And he says, I turned around and I said, I went back to him as he was just getting his car and starting it up. And he said, and this is what he said to him. He said, I can't imagine being in heaven without you, Dave. So you drive safe, okay? It might be slippery out there. And that's all he said, and he turned around and went back in the house. Well, Dave got home safe that day. Nothing happened. But the years, the years that followed, Dave, Dave had circumstances in his life that, that he could do nothing but just turn up and look at God. And he eventually gave his heart to God and, and became active at Willow Creek and became a, a pretty important part of the ministry there. And he told Bill, he said, Bill, you know what? He says, that morning, as we were saying goodbye in your driveway, and you just said that you couldn't imagine being in heaven without me. He says, that morning was a turning point. And it took me a while to get where I needed to be. But that morning was a turning point. And I am here where I am today because of what you said that day. And so if it needs to be said this morning, I don't want to be in heaven without you. And why would you want to spend the next 20 years of your life or 30 years of your life or however much time you got left, why would you want to go through the storms of life alone when Jesus says that he will be near if we call upon him? And we can experience that, just that undeniable comfort that comes when we know that that he's there and he's got your back. Do you know Jesus? You You feel good about that? Do you feel confident in that? Nobody here is perfect. I ask you to raise, anybody raise your hand, you're perfect here. Nobody's going to put their hand up. And if somebody does, slap them, okay? Because they're not. (laughs) Nobody here is perfect. Far from it. But we're all dependent upon the Savior every day to try and live the way He wants us to live and just to lean on Him when we need Him the most. Why wouldn't you want that? Let's pray. As we, as we just pray, it seems like right now would be just a really, a really good opportunity for me to ask you if you need to make a decision today to, to join arms with Christ and make him your savior. Because none of us want to be separated in heaven and none of us want to journey through life facing these difficult things alone. And so, if I could make this decision for everybody here, I'd do it. I'd just say, God, save them all. Let's go home. But I can't do that. No one can do that. Only, only, only you can turn your heart to God right now and say, God, forgive me. Yeah, it, it is my fault. And I put my life entirely in your hands. I want to be your child. And if there be someone here today that's never done that and needs to do that, I pray that those would be just their simple words on their heart right now. Because, Lord, you don't make our life perfect, but you do comfort us when we need it the most. Thank you, Lord, for the cross. Thank you for Calvary. Thank you for your blood that was shed that we may know forgiveness and that we may know strength for the journey here and hope in all of eternity. Lord, for these things we thank you. May all of us, Lord, consider these things this day. We ask them in Jesus' name. Amen.